Hello everyone, welcome to the Recruiters Hangout. Mm. Sorry we're a bit late today, that's my fault, I've had a few technical glitches. Um, today's topic is how should recruiters be dealing with backdoor placements. I'm very pleased to welcome Lisa Jones and Carla Murray. Lisa's been here with us before, uh, rec tech and social media expert, I think it's a fair description, from Barclay Jones. Check out Lisa's blog, excellent blog. Um, so welcome back Lisa. We've Hi. also got Carla here, thank you for joining us. Carla from uh, Morrison's Resource Manager at Morrison's, so it'll be great to hear your perspective on this topic. Um, the Recruiters Hangout is sponsored by Colleague Software, I'm Lou Welcome, also by Alan Witt from, from AppTech Partnerships and RC Euro. Um, today we've got Mark uh, hosting um, from the Recruitment Alliance, uh, F10 Group, and also smart, isn't it, Mark? Mark um, Cooter, Louis, Louis. Yeah, that's it. Um, and um, Louis Trince uh, is also going to be doing our usual follow-up blog from UK Recruiter, who supports us. Um, Alan couldn't make it today, so I've, I'm going to ask Mark to be today's host. I'll be keeping an eye online for your questions and comments, so please send them via hashtag RecHangout or via the Google Plus. Q&A app. Okay, over to you, Mark. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we've got an interesting topic today, um, looking at a, an issue which is close to the hearts of many recruiters, um, the issue of dealing with backdoor placements, uh, which is really the, uh, uh, the instances where we are providing candidates through to clients and uh, clients potentially taking those candidates directly and cutting the recruitment recruiter out of the mix. So we're going to be talking today with uh, Lisa, who's been doing some topic, or, uh, some work on this topic, um, to look at this particular issue, uh, why it's so important, what recruiters and clients could be doing um, to to avoid this and to avoid malpractice. Uh, we're going to get the client end view from Carla, and um, but before we, we go into the detail, I think we just get our guests today to introduce themselves. So um, Carla, would you like to to start off and introduce us to uh, who you are, what you're doing, and uh, um, we can kick start and can move on to Lisa after that. Yep, no problem. So I'm Carla, so I look after the um, direct sourcing team at Morrison. So we're a team of 15, uh, stretching across head office, retail, manufacturing, logistics and supply chain. Um, we restructured to do a direct sourcing in February, so it's still quite early days, um, but still heavily rely on agencies um, and have some great partnerships. But clearly some of those partnerships um, work really, really well, and then we do have, um, as Mark said, speculative applications that we need to deal with as well. Okay, and I believe you have a background in uh, recruitment agency work as well, is that right? I do, yes. So I used to work with Lisa at Burns Carlton, um, and previous to that a much smaller um, recruitment agency looking after hospitality. So, um, yes, yeah, so experience of backdoor placements from a recruiter point of view, but also from a client point of view, having to deal with them and deal with them professionally, actually. Excellent. Well, we look forward to uh, hearing your opinions on that. Lisa, would you like to give your introduction? I'm Lisa. I'm from Barclay Jones. We uh, work exclusively with recruiters on their recruitment technology projects like CRM, anything recruitment tech related, and also you'll see us often working with recruiters on becoming more tactical and strategic using social media to source, generate leads, and overall improve their brand. Excellent. There we go. So, well, let's let's get straight into the subject then. Lisa, tell us a bit about what you've been doing on this particular topic and what, what you've discovered along the way. Uh, I think I've been in recruitment for a, a while, which I say almost too often now, and that probably proves that I've been in it too long. I don't know. Starting in the early 2000s, where I started off in a 150-person recruitment business with no computers. We had uh, four machines in the business, North Sea, South, uh, East and West, and you could use them if your boss went for a fag because it was classed as admin. And obviously things have moved on significantly, but I think a lot of us that have been in recruitment in a while will respect the fact that recruitment tech is a relatively new thing, be certainly in the last 10, 15 years. And backdoor placements for the business that I worked in, if you'll know what it is, you can check my LinkedIn profile and smile Riley if you know the business I came from, great business. Uh, were a process, uh, not just an outcome. So at the end of every month, probably two to three days before uh, the doors shut on the um, kind of fees, etc. The administration team, and it was vast, would basically call all of the candidates that had gone for interview where nothing had been heard um, at their new roles, obviously anticipating that if John Smith picked the phone up, 
um, that what would naturally happen from there is that they would then hang up um, and give that data back to the recruiter. And then the recruiter would obviously then um, start a process of running around like a lunatic. <laughs> so obviously uh, that involved um, them coming to my team, who were the IT team, scanning through the ADAPT databases we had back then, desperately looking for any smidgen of information that might prove that that candidate was sent by that consultant. Um, massively administrative uh, process, um, looking through email archives, bits of paper, drawers, filing cabinets. But then it was a bit like the scene from broadcast news when she's dashing down the room with a VHS cassette uh, with that final bit of copy to prove that actually we can now get the fax machine out and fax the client <laughs> the terms that they signed or the email that proved that the terms have been sent. Flash forward to 2014 and not much has changed. Uh, apart from the fact that maybe we use systems to do some of that now. Um, so what I've been doing over the last year or so is talking to my clients about these backdoor placements, appreciating the fact that we're post-recession, but that doesn't necessarily mean we've got huge amounts of confidence, and that goes for your clients as well. And when I've been speaking to recruitment directors and asking them, do you have backdoor placements, um, the mood in the room can change according to the size of the recruiter and the processes that they've got, but it's pretty much split down the middle. You've either got 50% of the recruiters I've spoken to are desperately uncomfortable about the fact that they do have them. Some of them even uncomfortable about pursuing them uh, because they kind of just are either embarrassed or just feel like it's gone too far. And then the other 50% love them, uh, a love-hate relationship maybe, and actually have a, a, a compliance team or a person that actively looks for them on a monthly basis and they manage to smash their targets by finding these backdoor placements. What's also interesting is, depending on who you speak to, they have different names for backdoor placements as well. And my favorite is um, Bad Weasel. Um, and you can obviously define that as you wish. Uh, I've had lots of swear words, which, you know, maybe I'll blog about that one day. We've got Bob's uh, behind our backs. We've got missed placements. But ultimately, a backdoor placement is where the candidate has started working for the client and no one's been paid. So that's kind of the, the history behind it. I don't think much has changed. Um, interestingly, there's a new piece of tech on the market over in the States called Fee Catcher, um, and they are now using uh, social profiling to help recruiters um, identify misplacements. Everyone's going to be going to feedcatcher.com. I'm not being paid to say this, by the way. But I've been working with them and getting some stats together. And interestingly, they've got some stats. For example, according to them, less than 10% of candidate submissions are tracked over time. And I'm quite disappointed in that because the technology should allow us to be better than what we were. I just think potentially we have accepted the fact that backdoor placements are a thing of the past, or no, that they're, they're part of the common process, and that they're just, they're just as it is a bit of a fait accompli. They happen. Maybe we'll have some process to allow us to get that feedback, or maybe we're just so bloody busy placing two out of ten vacancies in the UK that will just move on to the next one. So I've spoken for a long time, but that's kind of why I'm in this room right now getting quite passionate about why these are why the process needs to change. Okay, well, some, in, some interesting statistics there. I mean, a, a lot of what you're talking about there was sort of using technology to follow up um, on campaigns that have been, um, been completed. What can, is there anything recruiters can do you know, during the course of the campaigns um, to, to try and help avoid this? Because it is an embarrassing situation. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been a recruiter myself and uh, come across a couple of uh, backdoor placements uh, over the time that I worked as a recruiter. It was very awkward, especially as both of them were with clients that we had ongoing relationships with and regular campaigns being run. Mm. I, I think there's there's so many answers to this. Um, I, I think, um, and it's a shame, I don't know if Mitch Sullivan is, is going to join us today, but we, I've been having some interesting debates with him, if you can call it that, online about um, why this happens. And Steve Ward as well, to be fair. Um, I think there's a misnomer. I genuinely believe it's a misconception that backdoor placements, I'm getting a bit bored of that argument. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I absolutely agree that the recruiter process is a bit screwed right now. I think option paralysis is setting where you've got your average recruiter probably not had enough training, uh, sat there with too many systems, not enough process, pushing CVs out. And there's lots of businesses that you could quote on uh, the fact that that's their process and as long as some of the shit hits the, uh, sticks to the wall then they'll be fine. Um, but I do think that the CRM systems out there need to man up and have processes designed to help recruiters run their processes more effectively. At the moment, the systems are designed for choice, not uh, workflow. 
Um, I think that uh, recruitment directors, to be frank as well, dare I say, need to man up as well and start saying, you know, this is a, this is a, it might be their fault and they need to build processes in to make recruiters more effective. So in my day, back in 1874, I wrote a script for ADAPT which found candidates that had been sent for interview where they just fizzled out. And we used that to obviously identify these misplacements. Clearly, in this market, I kind of think we can need to be a lot better than that. I mean, that was 12 years ago that I wrote that script, and I'm still hearing from recruiters that don't have access to that kind of tech. Um, I do think that the social media streams now are access to too much talent, God forbid. And I think it's too easy now to send CVs out. So I'll give you a case study. I received a CV. We're actively looking for a project manager and a trainer in our business right now, and I've, I've engaged a recruiter to do that for me. And last night, um, we've still not, um, we, I say engaged, we've still not agreed terms, but she's sending me CVs. And I actually had to email her back and say, I don't want to see any more, I've not opened these CVs yet, because we've not agreed terms. And God forbid, by me receiving that CV, and then by some hook or by crook not reading it, and then in a month's time receiving an application from the same person, uh, that I'm now liable for a fee. And I think that's sometimes what happens. I don't think it's fair. Um, I do think that uh, that can be endemic in some recruiters that I've come across. But I do think it's about process, and I do think it's about accepting the fact that uh, these now are a fact of life, because some businesses do operate like that. But what are they going to do to preempt them and, and to stop them and to obviously work more closely with clients and candidates going forward? And I know that Carla has some very firm opinions on this as well from an in-house perspective mm -hmm. as well as an agency one. Q Carla. Yeah, Thank I you think for that seamless link. <laughs> I think the last bit that sorry. <laughs> I think the last bit that Lisa said in terms of not opening the C V. So we're savvy enough not to do that as recruiters and obviously Lisa is too. Um the hiring managers aren't, and you know, businesses have a duty of care to their business and their hiring managers to upskill them in that way, but that will always take time. Um so, you know, we have had numerous examples of not just backdoor placements, but place where, where people have opened the CV, therefore we've agreed to their terms when clearly we haven't. So that's a different conversation, but those happen more often than we would, we would like. Um, and for me, the biggest question in here is why recruiters feel the need to go directly to hiring managers. So even when I was trained, um, I was trained to avoid HR and to avoid recruiters. 10 years on or eight on, however I, I decide however old I decide to be on this call um, we're, we're still in that place I suppose that people try and avoid us we're actually if we want to get CVs over to hiring managers and if recruiters want to work with us it's about the partnership piece um, so I don't know if anybody else has got views as well on how internal recruiters and HR professionals probably work with recruiters um, I suppose examples, Mark, how have you found it? Well, I, th I think, you know, having been a recruiter and somebody was quite proactive, if I found a very good candidate and I was working with them yeah. exclusively, um, I could make placements by avoiding HR. If I got the hiring manager interested in the candidate, uh, there, is a, there is a very subtle way of managing that relationship and, in, and assisting the hiring manager in making those introductions to HR so that a relationship can start. Um, I think probably one of the issues in my, in my experience is pe people don't um, take the time to try and um, get that relationship off the ground. And uh, what Lisa was saying about, you know, there's a temptation with technology now just to fire CVs off, yeah. you know, in, in, and they, they land in somebody's inbox. And there's there's no human element there talking to somebody at the other end. I mean, I'm, I'm taking over the show a little bit here, but uh, I know the way round, my way around this was to ensure that the hiring manager introduced me to the HR person so that I could say why I was doing it. And I, and I, and I realized that what I was doing was trying to start a relationship. And maybe that CV wasn't the one that actually made a placement and got me up and running. But um, maybe, maybe that's where the breakdown is. And, uh, yeah. Well, Obviously, if you are if you are running campaigns, you want to receive candidates, I presume, from outside of your preferred supplier list if they're struggling to find people. And recruiters obviously don't know which ones they're struggling with. How, how do you cater for that? If let's say you you have got a job that hasn't had the right quality or quantity, and you do get a good CV come through to you, what, what would your your process be of subsequently engaging with that recruiter? Yeah, and, and it happens, and it's natural. We, we're recruiting, so you're never always going to be able to either get it in direct or use your preferred supplier. 
be foolish to cut to cut your nose off to spite you. So if we do get speculative applications through, we do explore them. Um, but absolutely, to Lisa's point, stages. However, when the hiring manager does it the other way, that's when the the trouble starts, I suppose. And it's hard to negotiate when recruiter already knows that you want to see that person. Mm. Um, you're not really in a, a, nego a negotiation at that point. Um, but we do consider speculative applications, but if they come at a period when we are still very early on, then we will probably pause them from that point, um, whether that's a rebrief or we continue in the, in the way that we're going. Our preferred supply list, let's face it, is, is it the death of the preferred supplier would be a question. Um, we, if I'm really honest, we have our preferred supply list, but we steer outside of it quite a lot at the moment. So um, there are new new ways of working in terms of agencies, um, job post being one, I suppose, but various different um, angles of looking at, at suppliers. Um, and I think it's, it's more than that, isn't it? It's, it's probably understanding why these things happen. But I think for me, there's a number of things. Is it the client that's in the wrong and knows it? And absolutely, if that is the case, then um, we, the business have every right to, to pay up and, and take that on the chin and work out a process that stops people from doing that. Um, there's also the other piece that we've talked about in terms of the business or the, the client, whatever you want to call them, just don't understand that that's how it works. Um, and then there's the other one that I don't agree with, which is the... I think some crew recruiters do still get a bit of a kick out of this. So, you know, when you are you are looking for your backdoor placements, there is a bit of excitement, isn't there? God, I'm going to make some money. And actually, I haven't done an awful lot to achieve that. So those ones, I think, yeah, we need to think differently about those. And from an agency point of view, that, that behavior is encouraged or has been previously encouraged. So there's a, you know, as Lisa said, jumping up and down, there's a level of excitement when you, you find you've got a backdoor placement. I don't think encouraging that mm. is the best way to start people building a relationship with HR, with hiring managers. And I find that one particularly frustrating, I think. And that's why agencies don't have a particularly great reputation sometimes. I think I would definitely go further than that and say that um, I think you know, there's two way, there's two streams of thought here. Is I, I'm a recruitment consultant. I, I find out I've got a backdoor placement, and like Carla said, in a lot of organisations, there's there's almost no shame in that. It's celebrating mm. the fact that they've actually discovered it. Um, <laughs> whereas, I don't know. Part of me just thinks, hold on a minute, I didn't do my bloody job right. Now, there is a percentage of missed placements where the client is absolutely at fault. I have case studies where I've spoken to all of my clients, and they're all gorgeous, by the way, where um, they admit that they might even have contractors offshore with offshore bank accounts holding clients to ransom. And that is a big problem for some clients that, that deal internationally as well, especially in the contract market, where the candidate is saying to the client, employ me direct or you don't get me back at the end of my tenure. And that obviously causes recruiters in the UK a big issue as well. And I'm sure there's all sorts of legal stuff that needs to happen, which is beyond my reach. But I think, you know, what recruitment directors and managers need to do is start assessing what the hell is going on in their businesses where all of the energy is going into reclaiming the fee and not into preventing it happening in the first place. And that is the yeah. most obvious thing. Anyone is likely to say, I'm bored myself with the concept of going back in time and studying the process because recruiters traditionally are very tactical creatures. They're not used to looking back in time. They're used to filling vacancies moving forward. But right now, it's just a real shame that for the majority of recruiters that have been on the market as long as I have, that the process for tackling placements has not really changed and for assessing the effectiveness of a recruiter beyond the fees that they're making hasn't really changed. But the market has changed massively and the ability for candidates to go direct has changed massively. The ability for a client, God forbid, to think that a LinkedIn recruiter license is going to solve all of their recruitment problems. That, I, I've just come out of a client meeting now where they're saying that hiring managers are buying LinkedIn recruiter licenses because they've been told they should. And six months later going, I can't cope with the volume of stuff that I've got to do right now. Please help me make sense of this. So I think what the agency market needs to do, and they, it takes five minutes, is to reassess what the bloody hell it is they're supposed to be doing for candidates and tell them what they do for candidates. 
you know, the Jerry Maguire film I always quote to my clients is, you know, what is it he does for, for his sports stars? He actually becomes an advocate for them. He negotiates on behalf of them and of the, you know, the football stadium. And that's where I see the recruitment market as really failing right now, is establishing what it is actually there to do, what its reason for being is. It's not there to fill vacancies. It's there to negotiate on behalf of the client and candidate, be an objective sector specialist, um, and I might be, I don't know, there might be some recruiters out there that think, hold on a minute, you're talking crap. Well, if I am, then we're kind of buggered really from a recruitment perspective because if the only value we offer is to find CVs and push them at someone until they buy them, then God help us, we're doomed. If we offer value, which is, I'm working with Carla, I found some great talent, I understand the market, I understand the talent, I'm going to make sure the talent actually bloody well starts the job, I'm going to make sure that Carla pays what that job is worth, then I'm offering some massive value. And I think, unfortunately, some businesses see backdoor placements as an option to just simply increase their revenue rather than look at their process and say, actually, how can I prevent this from happening and make my business process run a lot more effectively? Feel like a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's happening right behind me right now. Sorry. There's a couple of comments that have come through, um, and, and there's, a, there's a bit of a question at the end there. So um, this person hasn't said their name, but they come through as, as digital huntsmen. Um, <laughs> you guys might know who they are. <laughs> um, recruiters tend to believe that a spec candidate who gets hired is a backdoor placement. It's mm. not. Um, mm. I, I don't think that I was intimating that it was a backdoor placement, but, but specking candidates in is part of um, the problem, uh, which I was just um, trying to relate to. Um, Toby Coulshaw says labour spend is a procurement issue and a recruitment issue. Uh, get purchasing involved ASAP to centralise speed and control. Anybody want to refer to that? Spend uh, and control. control. I think that was spend and control. Spend and control. What did I say? Speed and control. Yep. Spend and control. Sorry. So yeah, I mean, if procurement get involved, I mean, is that going to help address the issue, Carla? Cut today. You still there, Carla? Yeah, no, no, I am. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, did you hear the question? Yeah, something about speed or spend and control in terms of procurement. Yes, Toby was saying that, you know, labour spend is a procurement issue and recruit yeah. under recruitment issue and we need to get, um, you know, purchasing involved as soon as possible to centralise spend and control spend. Yeah, I think absolutely right and we're going through that process now actually in terms of um, looking at what we do and how we do it from a spend point of view, both... Um, agency in head office and the businesses, so salad recruitment, but also from an hourly point of view, um, and they're supporting us with that to make sure that we have the right providers, but also provide some governance around it, and I think that's where a lot of um, recruiters fall down in terms of having the governance, but also being able to show the business that if you had done it in the way that we ask you to, so follow process, this is what you would have spent, and actually this is your leakage, so almost a dashboard of um, controls and having that governance around it. But I think absolutely procurement is key in it. Okay, so what, what, what happens then? Because there's another comment from um, this contributor as well saying that external recruiters firing CVs across to hiring managers undermines the internal recruitment relationship. You know, yeah. but are, 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 are businesses wrong to respond by ta and taking a candidate in this way? Um, I don't think it's wrong. I think if you're a hiring manager, you're, work, you're recruiting for your team and somebody, by hook or by crook, sends a, a candidate at the right time um, that you want to see. I, I don't think you can blame them for wanting to, to pursue it. I think as long as they go in the right way about it and talk to the recruiters, which actually are, most of our hiring managers are pretty good at now, um, then, you, then you you deal with it in that way. But I, I you said something you earlier. Have to you have to consider people, don't you? You said something earlier, Carlo. Actually, that was quite interesting. You know, with regards to hiring managers engaging with outside agency recruiters, and this creating yeah. an internal conflict between HR. I mean, is is that part of the problem that? Um, uh, the, the hiring manager has lost confidence or in some way in the HR person that they feel that they have to move outside of protocol? Um, I think it depends and I think when people engage with agencies that are outside a lot of the time it's when new people join our business so you come with relationships don't you so you like to bring those relationships over with you. Um, I, do, I do think it's a problem and when you're in 
when you've got a business like ours, especially when you've got you know manufacturing, logistics, and retail that are very much out of head office and trying to control that, it does become a problem. Do I think that it undermines the relationship? I think if it gets too bad, yes, obviously it does. There's a, there's a breakdown, isn't there? Um, and it's about getting that volume of people to understand process, which is always a very difficult thing to do. Um, so we've a Kim. Kim's just posted something through. Um, uh, internal recruiters stealing candidates. What about external recruiters who are claiming to represent the company without an agreement, potentially damaging the company's image? Um, mm. And the ability for me to do my job well. Where's the accountability? Anybody want to jump in with any thoughts on that? Well, is is Kim an? In, am I misunderstanding this? Is it is yeah, Kim an internal so. recruiter or an external recruiter? What do you think, Louis? She looked like a, I think probably an internal recruit. No, uh, digital from Digital Huntsman again. So, um, I, I I couldn't tell from from where she's coming from. It's a he, and he he is. Sorry, Kim. You carry on, guys. I'll do the research. I'll track it down. <laughs> let's, 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 let's assume that Kim is an internal recruiter. What I want to know is, and what I want to understand is, and this is a question more than anything for the people that are listening and or uh, the people on the, on the Google Hangout itself, is why is it that we are still in the techno age that we are, where we can bloody land a thingy on a comet, whatever it was, <laughs> that, we, that, we, <laughs> that we, can't, um, we can't spend a couple of minutes in our day to actually track all of our placements. Again, according to Fee Catcher, only between 5 and 10% uh, of placements are tracked. Um, and actually, according to them, with the clients that they've worked with, uh, between 5 and 10% of placements that they make are missed, which potentially, you know, if you're a million pound turnover business, that's 100 grand's worth of missed placements, which is a lot of money. Um, and I, I still don't understand why recruitment directors are not building time into their day to one, maybe spend a year studying why it's happening, looking at particular recruiters because it will be the same little monkeys every time they have the problem maybe, looking at particular sectors. I mean, I want to know if there are any sectors out there where this happens more than not, more, more, more times than not. Are there particular parts of the world where this happens more than not? Um, and, and then wrapping back and saying, right, what am I going to do to improve my process to make so I don't have to spend time on this anymore? We can all talk about marketing and making recruiters more valuable to the process, and you obviously know my views on this, but if recruitment managers and directors get too much out of, of playing chicken with their clients, then we're not going to really fix the problem, and it's going to continue when I'm retired, which hopefully will clearly be next year. I mean, okay, so we've, we've talked about you know uh, what recruiters can do um, to try and avoid this happening and to um, monitor their activities to see if it has happened. Why, why do clients do it? You know, why do they think they can get away with it? Because both of you said you've both been recruiting recently and you're frightened to even open the CV. Now, I I'm not sure what the legals are, but I don't think anybody can enforce terms of business on you and force you to do business with them. I th I I'm not quite sure that that's the case. I had conversations with REC in the past about this. But um, why do clients think they can get away with it? Any thoughts on that? Um, is it just purely a cost-saving exercise? Because they can. Because yeah. they can, because it's uh, there's no doubt that um, you know this game of chicken exists because uh, I might have more wealth in my business and more balls maybe than the person that's sending me that CV in the first place, and I actually suspect from the from the size of the business that I'm dealing with right now that that might be the case. Um, and I think as well, those it might be that to be frank, the way that the the relationship has been built or not built will reflect on whether or not I give a toss. Yeah. So you know. I could give a case study, this isn't real, but I'm sure it exists in different environments where the consultant's not done any research on my business, they don't know anything about me, they've not even had a conversation, but they've sent me a CV with terms. And I look at that and I go, yet another recruiter who's not building a relationship with me, and actually I do have a need in my business, and i just not had time to find anyone, great, let's see how far I can push this. And then it is the game of chicken. And, I, and I'm not saying that clients are wrong or right in doing that, but I, I do think that the answer lies within the process itself, which is what has that recruiter actually done? Um, really, has it really cost them 15 grand to send that CV across to the client? And you'll rarely hear me slating the recruitment industry because I'm a passionate advocate of it. But I, like I said last night, I received this CV and this person hasn't invested any time in me whatsoever. She's not even received a job spec yet and I'm receiving CVs. And I think unfortunately that that is what gives the market such a bad reputation. I, think I completely agree with that, Lise, actually. 
So I just I just think that, um, and obviously we've got the comments back from Kim now, who turns out to be a bloke as an internal recruiter. So it looks like Kim is having the problem where external recruiters are posing as him, talking to hiring managers. Again, I would suggest that this is an education piece. I would suggest Kim, God forbid, what kind of relationship are you building with your own internal hirers? That might be something to think about. Again, I think it's just making the, the, the role of the recruiter really clear and transparent. Um, uh, and taking time over that, which again is, is doesn't seem to be part of anyone's process right now. Mm. So, what sort of what sort of things can we? Let's look at both sides of it. Then, what sort of things can the end client do? Um, given that we we all agree that uh, you know where there is certain shortages in skills, um, to uh, enable um, external agencies who aren't part of the preferred supplier list to engage appropriately. You know, what can they do? Could they set a set of terms and make them visible in the career uh, career pages so that it says if you send me an unsolicited CV, this is how it has to work. These are the terms that you'll have to comply to. So can we not count this? Because if a can if a recruiter can send a set of terms of business with a CV, can't you put a set of terms on your website say these are the set of terms we work to? If you Carla, send me an unsolicited CV. What does Carla have to say? Because that's a pro proper good question. Yeah, and you can, but actually, like you've just said, could you could you enforce them? I suppose it's just a warning, like anything else. It's like putting it on the bottom of the the adverts, isn't it? We won't be expect um, accepting speculative CVs. It doesn't actually stop anything. Um, for me, there's the, there's the process piece and there's the education piece and there's the partnership inside your own business um, that allows us to to work through it. Um, I said, yeah, I suppose it's a, I've not thought about putting it on the website, if I'm honest. Um, but again, I'm not sure what it would what it would solve. Well, it would certainly say that you've laid out your terms of business if, if a, an unsolicited application comes in. If it says, you know, if you send me a CV and we do decide to consider it, these are the terms of business that you'll have to operate under. I'm pretty certain that would stand up in court. You've made it quite clear. Yeah. They haven't bothered to read your terms and just submit their own CV. They don't automatically override, I'm sure. No, no, I think you're right, actually. Um, it's something for recruiters, internal recruiters to, to certainly consider um, alongside everything else because it doesn't feel like it's going away, does it? So there's, um, there's probably a, a bigger discussion to understand what everybody could do to resolve it. Well, tell you what, my, one of my biggest bugbearers as a recruiter was sending a CV through to a client uh, only for the client to say that they were going to take the CV from another source when the candidate had quite outrightly said that they had spoken to me in the first instance and I was the only person that discussed the job. So it, it, this is part of the same problem for a recruiter, isn't it? You know, the, the client yeah. could determine to take the CV from another source, not just take them directly. Yeah, we have, um, we have, we probably have more interactions with agencies on things like that than we do with backdoor placements, actually, in terms of, the candidate's already been submitted, but the, the, another agency wants to represent them, and they've got emails from the candidate. And the candidate experience for me there is is completely put at risk, more so than the backdoor placements. Um, you know, we have agencies with us have um, known the candidate for six months, but that's only on one vacancy, so somebody else could submit um, if they've talked about a different vacancy. But actually from an internal point of view, specifically for us, that's a bigger problem for us. Well, I mean, uh, part of that can be resolved with technology. I know that the own, our own platform will not allow for duplicate applications to come through. Yeah. Um, it just will not let them come through the door, so the first person that puts the CV through. I guess then once the CV is received, it's up to the um, employer to determine whether or not the recruiter has performed in a responsible way. Um, because I think there's some laws here as well that say, you know, you have to share the details of the job, the location of the job, the salary of the job, uh, and ask for permission before you can submit a CV. And if that hasn't happened, I don't think that the recruiter has any legal rights to representation anyway. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that particular point, Lisa? No, to be fair. I just, I, again, I just think it's down to um, the systems these days should really be able to cope with this and not enough of them do. Um, and I think there's there's almost in most systems that I see too much choice about whether or not a recruiter actually engages with the system in order to make the placement in order to send out information. I'm obviously not suggesting that we turn everyone into some sort of board collective from Star Trek and that they 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 they're almost like funneled. But I I do I just 
I just don't think the processes exist to prevent this from happening. And I think that's because the people leading the businesses either accept the fact that backdoors happen and, or, or, or probably more importantly, don't actually know they're happening. So they're not building anything around them to prevent them. Okay. So, well, there's been some good advice that's come out today. I mean, there's a, a couple of tools that you've mentioned there, Lisa, was it Bad Weasel? And, um, <laughs> I think, I think ultimately, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what recruiters call backdoor placements because I've had some very colourful, uh, I almost nearly did like a collage on it in my more kind of wine-soaked moments. But Bad Weasel and Shafters was, was fantastic for me. Um, and I think uh, the feed catcher system certainly which is, is running over in the States quite happily at the moment they've got some fantastic stats around how um, they're engaging with people's CRM systems to track missed placements and make them more effective which is probably a much more well will definitely be a much more uh, sophisticated version of the clips that I wrote on adapt back in 2003 to track candidates that had disappeared from an interview um, so I, I just think again it's it's back down to process and obviously you know looking at systems out there that might actually plug in and make you more successful at this okay Louis just a quick question for you um, couldn't these tools not be integrated into CRM yes <laughs> yes, well, we're working on some new. Uh, we're working on a new product next year, so actually, worth having a chat, Lisa, about some of these ideas and what, mm. what, where the CRM needs to improve. Mm. Um, how we got the opportunity to do so, but uh, my experience from CRMs is there isn't enough workflow. Um, like a lot of CRMs in the main uh, other markets, um, there is too much, too many opportunities to make mistakes um, mm. from manual work, um, not enough good use of the data, um, like you were talking earlier, Lisa, mm. so, so directors can make the best decisions. The reason why people don't take the time is because for a lot of the software, it's too difficult to um, actually get the data out. Mm. Well, the data is probably not in there in the first place. I think that's half oh. the battle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Or they have tons of data, but it's not not actually very useful the way it's being displayed. Or, or um, so the sort of technology needs to try and help lead the way rather than just waiting for instruction. Because um, I'm not sure that instruction will always come. So, well, it's it's an important point actually. You know, if re recruiters are going to protect themselves, is to document everything in the CRM, all the communications that have taken place. That should happen know, automatically. Hmm. Yeah, uh, but also putting notes in there because anybody can click a button to say terms of business sent. But you know, putting some, um, some some something around that, you know, to show that you've actually engaged and spoken to that person, it is going to help support you if the worst can say case scenario you end up in court over this issue. Well, ultimately, your email should all be being tracked in your CRM if you're a recruiter, and in in, the, in terms of more important notes. Like Lisa suggests, it shouldn't let you go beyond a certain work, um, place, work, place in the workflow without forcing you to, you know, update update that entry and get the right information there. But uh, working working with with the recruiter's workflow, so it doesn't actually slow them down. But there are some things you just need to have have there to protect mm -hmm. the business and give you the right analytics at the end of the day. I mean, as a recruiter, I mean, you, obviously when you're spinning off an, an ad hoc CV into a customer for the first, and it's your first engagement with that customer, it's a bit more difficult. But, you know, we used to have a rule in our business that if you started trading with an organization, you know, you took the job spent, went away and worked on that job, and you hadn't pre-agreed terms, I wouldn't pay you a commission. And that was a bit strong enough incentive to ensure that your recruiter mm. did get terms of business and do a credit check on that client before they started doing any work on it. You know, especially where you're given the work to go away. It's a bit different when you're sitting there with a CV, you're already representing a candidate. You know, the, 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 the risk of time that's being allocated to that activity, you know, it isn't, isn't so great. But if you go away and work for a week on a campaign and then the client at the end of it says they want to pay you 10% instead of your usual 20%, mm. it's extremely frustrating for all parties. But again, I think it's it's to do with the fact that we're measuring the end result, we're measuring, and again, I sound like a bit of a communist here, and I think everyone should get all fluffy and hug a tree and get back to process, but we're focusing on the end result. You know, recruitment directors are very good at focusing on the invoice, the billing rate, the percentages, all that lovely stuff, and we obviously need to reassess the beginning of the process again, and I also think what we need to do is recruitment, you know, there's recruitment leaders out there that just need to take a long, hard look at their order book and say, I'm working too many vacancies here, there's something has got to give, and probably the reason why the process is a bit screwed is, on average, the average recruiter that I've spoken to in the UK and there are some that are worse than this are only filling two out of every ten vacancies which means 80% of what they're doing is 
pointless. And therefore, potentially, that's where a lot of this is coming from because they are they're feeling that the volume piece is almost like overtaken the quality. And as a result of that, they're firing CVs out and not actually having the time or the processes or the investment of, of systems to actually get them to look at what they're doing to add value. You know, if I genuinely felt that someone had done a really, really good job for me, I wouldn't have the balls to try and negotiate them down. But that's it's almost their job to, to demonstrate their value. And I'm not, again, going back to the point, I don't think a lot of recruiters out there either have the time or the tools to demonstrate the value that they're offering to this particular process. Agreed. That's quite a nice way to wrap up. Carlo, I'd like to give you just an opportunity just to, have you got any final thoughts before we pass over to Louis, who's going to talk to us about the next Hangout? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's, um, I think, yes, it's, it's almost for um, agency and internal recruiters to, to solve this together, because I think there's probably um, real value from both parts in terms of understanding each other and I think some, that's sometimes a miss so whether or not that's an opportunity I don't know. Lisa final thoughts? Uh, I've given you loads of thoughts already I just think I we need to get jiggy with the process again and start maybe <laughs> starting in you know January 1st saying what is it I'm actually supposed to be doing here what's the outcome of my job and how can I remind clients and candidates of why it's necessary for me to be involved in this process. And I, I just think that will actually fix not just the backdoor placement process, but it will fix the attraction model that seems to be eroded by, right by the direct hire model. And, and ultimately trying to re-engage with hiring managers and people like Carla in, in a more professional setting. It doesn't have to be a game of chicken every time they send a CV out. Great. That's um, been a good show today. Thank you very much for, to both of our guests, um, Lisa Jones from Barclay Jones and Carla Murray, uh, Resource Manager at Morrisons. Um, just going to hand over now quickly to Louis, who's going to tell us about our next Hangout. Um, hopefully we'll see you both again some point soon. Thank you everybody for listening. Over Thank you. you Louis. Thanks, Mark. Before everyone disappears and clicks the cross at the corner of the window, um, we've got a great piece of follow-up content that we're now making called Highlights from the Hangout, and we put this on SlideShare, and I spend ages <laughs> going through and sang out afterwards getting all the best quotes from um, the guests and also the viewers so you can have um, a, sort of a, a summary of what was said and all the best useful points that you can grab and share. The one we did a week ago has now got set, had 700 views so I'm very pleased with that. Um, so I'll make sure that's sent out to everyone that signed up and Lisa's blog notes from the Hangout will also be sent out um, to everyone who signed up to that rec hangout list. Two weeks time, um, the date will be, uh, what's two weeks? Uh, Catherine Robinson, the sorceress, an excellent, excellent sorcerer will be joining us on the 3rd of December at 1 p.m. That will be our last hangout before um, our Christmas break um, so we can all uh, relax. But uh, please do join us for that one. Catherine's got some very useful tips and tools and so forth. We'll send around a more solid title for that um, nearer the time. Uh, anyway, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Mark, for hosting. Excellent job. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.